And right now, I would like to welcome to the stage um, our first keynote speaker, Ava Black. They are um, with the uh, Cyber Information, or CISA, sorry, um, with the US government. Um, they're gonna be talking about obviously making open source secure as the title implies, but also um, you know, how we as a community can approach um, security and maybe a little bit about a special exercise that we're going to do this afternoon. So with that in mind, um, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage in just a few minutes, Ava Black. Good morning. Good morning. My first time at an Apache conference, not my first time using any of the software. You all do awesome stuff, but I'm super happy to be here and talk a little bit about um, the last year and a half of my work and what CISA is doing around open source software security. But bear with me with some uh, technical challenges. I love how uh, effective Cloud Sync is. So bear with me one second. There we go. Cool. So for those of you who are not familiar with CISA, uh, anybody in here not familiar with the US Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency? Oh, fair number. Cool. Um, well, we serve as the US's lead Cyber Defense Agency, stress on the defense there, um, and the National Coordinator for Critical Infrastructure Resilience. And so we lead the effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk to cyber software systems, digital systems, operational technology, networks um, across the country. Uh, and that includes things like water and power and transportation, communication, and healthcare. We work with partners all across the private sector and the public sector and international partners and now open source communities as well uh, to prepare for and mitigate the kinds of impacts that happen when bad things happen. And to advocate for policy changes that will strengthen our national security around open source software. Not the agency, me in the agency, but yeah, and support partnerships around that. So for those who don't know me, um, I did not start my career thinking I would ever, ever work for the government. Um, I swore in like 2000 I'd never work at Microsoft because they hated open source back then. And then I joined Microsoft like four years ago. Uh, and then two years ago I was invited to kind of speak at the White House a little bit and then they offered me a job, so here I am. Um, careers are weird sometimes. But I, I understood early on in college in the 90s that society advances faster when we all collaborate. And I saw the beginnings of the open source ethos around that time, and the formation of Apache and EFF and, and so on. I thought, this is, this is just a better way for us all to, to work. Of course it makes sense. And so my whole career has been in open source, um, working whether it's at low layers of the stack, like IPMI and Redfish for hardware management, or cloud automation and Kubernetes and OpenStack, databases with MySQL I've been a contributor to and a user of a lot of these projects, maintainer of some, and building uh, products of companies some of the time. So today, I'm gonna to share a little bit of the historical perspective that I've picked up along that way, uh, still standing on the shoulders of all the folks who came before and great work of others. Talk a little bit about what CIS is doing right now and then talk a little bit about some tools that we've published that hopefully you can use, whether it's in your community or to take back to your employer or to tell your networks about you know, how to make all of the stuff we rely on a little bit safer. So um, at security events, we're given this talk a couple times, I usually ask who uses open source. I don't need to ask you all that. <laughs> but I do think I want to ask a different question. Um, how many of you think there's open source software running in your car? Keep your hand up if you think there's more than 10 computers running open source in your car. More than 50. More than 100. It's higher. Modern European cars have somewhere between 120 to 200 discrete computers, most of them running open source, including open source orchestration systems to control all of it. Um, one more poll for the room. How many of you, this is how I calibrate the rest of my talk, um, how many of you were contributing regularly to open source communities before 2015, 2016? 
It's like about half the room. <laughs> um, cool. So some of this talk will hopefully not be news for you all. Feel free to find me afterwards and throw rotten tomatoes at me or whatever, peanuts. If I, if I said something that you disagree with, I would love to hear about it. And for those of you who weren't, I hope this is useful context for what's happening today in the world. So lots of studies, maybe if you've seen these numbers flying around, show that enterprise code bases almost all use open source. There's tons of open source in every commercial application. And even said Microsoft like made the pivot in 2018, Linux dominated Azure workloads. GitHub, not the only place open source happens by a long shot, but the easiest one for me to get a, a number on, more than 150 million projects. Open source is, is really, really succeeded. Oops, that was a weird fight. Um, there was a research paper published from Harvard earlier this year that points out that the supply side value of widely used open source is around four billion. That is, the amount of money being spent to maintain it. But the demand side value is literally 2,000 times higher than the value society gets from that work. Most of it, the vast majority, is done by only about 5% of contributors. That's probably most of the folks in this room fall in that 5%. Certainly if you're a maintainer of an open source project like Spark, so much value is created in economies around the world by what you're doing. However, we all sit on a precarious balance. Chances are everyone in this room already saw this slide. My favorite things is that friends have been sending me variations of this whenever bad things happen. So when CrowdStrike happened, this one got in my, my inbox. <laughs> and uh, just this week, a friend sent me this one. <laughs> um, Really, the lesson here is, well, I'm gonna go back in time. I'm gonna start that sort of insert sound effects here. Um, back to about 2005 is when I, I heard Martin Mikos first say this in the MySQL community, that companies, products, have money but no time. They can buy things quickly to get to market. But communities and projects have time but no money. This to me, has always captured the tension between communities and companies in a way that articulates the flip side of this well. We've all heard of Linus's law, I hope, um, but given enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. This is why open source is safer, because more people can review it. However, today, there is so much more code being written than people who can spend time to review it. The most important thing that makes open source safe to use is the development process, the collaboration, the review, and the ability for communities to respond and for consumers to study and analyze it. But without that process, it's no different than proprietary software, possibly worse. But even so, it provides this incredible mechanism for open innovation where actors across the world can share and collaborate in a digital commons to build and commodify layers of technology all up and down that stack, cuts across sectors, and to compete on top of it. A little bit of the historical basis here for folks that weren't around in the early days. Um, I was a college kid when Bernstein was happening, and I was kind of worried about my own code, um, and that uh, some government official would come knocking and say, Eva, you are going to come to a small room and talk with us now because you wrote encryption. Um, Copyright Act of 76 established that source code is a creative work. So if you, if you hear open source is free like free speech, it's in relation to that. Um, and then Bernstein, in this case, set the precedent that regulatory restrictions on an individual's ability to publish code, which might be encryption, which might be functional, uh, should not be preempted by any uh, government body. The legal basis for that is different in different countries, though, so just keep that in mind. But then two key things came out in the 20 years since, the four freedoms and the four opens. There's probably different formulations of that, but those community norms, I'll talk more in just a minute, of open source, open design process, open development process, and open community are what create the safety or the trustworthiness of open source software. It's built together in the open for anyone to see how it was built. 
as opposed to, as my friend Thierry likes to say, single vendor open source is the new proprietary. The title of the talk he gave at FOSDEM earlier this year. I thought it was very timely. But open does not necessarily mean free. You all know this. Um, it's not free like free beer, it's free like a free puppy. If you uh, take open source back into a corporate environment and don't take care of it, bad things happen. It wrecks your house. Free does also not mean open. Just because software is published under an open source license and is available for free does not mean that it is fully open, that people can participate. There are a lot of companies that choose to release their product as open source for various reasons, but prevent any participation in it. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Let me give a quick, brief timeline of open source software. And this is where peanuts are welcome. Um, back in the 90s, 80s and 90s, where a couple of the, the, the foundational foundations started around the idea of free software. And open source came actually at the end of the 90s, um, but this provided an early competitive advantage uh, to the early adopters. And then, yeah, the OSD was written down in about 98. The Bernstein case is around for most of the 90s, finally closed in 99. And that's roughly when the first version of SSL was written, sort of emerging from the Bernstein uh, case test. Six, seven years later, Amazon launches EC2, and MySQL gets acquired. This was pivotal because it was the first time an open source company, one of those, you know, folks like us, um, got bought for a billion dollars, and I have to say my pinky up. Because um, it was a really big deal in 2008 that a little open source company was acquired by big tech. Silicon Valley took notice, the investors took notice, private equity took notice, and all of a sudden, a lot of money began pouring in to open source projects, and companies were told, release some stuff. And there was a big change there. The, at the same time, the companies that had already been building on open source, Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc., cetera, um, were seeing tremendous growth and market advantage. And a lot of other uh, companies began to try to emulate that. And Cloud Native launched in 2014, OpenStack in 2011-ish, and Heartbleed happened. And then LeftPad happened. And these were interesting moments because they were the first time that I saw national attention on vulnerabilities or risks of using open source, but not really thoroughly addressed. Open source's success grew by the end of the 2010s. And here we are in the mid-2020s now, open source has permeated every part of the technology stack, from the Mars rover, to our cars, to our power grid, to uh, open source AI, in air quotes there, um, models being deployed on automated entry sensors at doors. Like, the, the, the supply chain has now become so complex and dependent on the volunteer work of communities like this one. And because of that, I suspect, because of our own success, a lot of threat actors, that's our term for folks who want to do harm, um, are starting to target open source itself, whether that's an increase in uh, typo spotting attacks, which every package manager has seen in the past five years, or directed uh, social engineering attacks to try and emulate a trusted maintainer when they're intending something bad years down the line, or social engineering attacks against individual maintainers like each of you to try and either bribe you or coerce you to do something bad that you may not even know is bad, but it undermines the supply chain. It plants a bug someone else can exploit. We're seeing a lot more of that rise now. So, no peanuts were thrown at me. I guess I did a good enough job. No one shouted that I was wrong. Um, I'll talk a little bit about CISA's open source roadmap. Our goal is to foster an open source ecosystem, recognizing it is very diverse, global, that is secure, sustainable, and resilient, supported by um, a vibrant community. 
And we believe the federal government should be participating as a community member. We're not here to tell you all what to do. We're here to learn and participate. But we should also be making the requisite investments in the infrastructure, in the community, uh, and recognizing we do not control or govern open source. So um, this roadmap, these four goals, and what we'll talk about next, is roughly a three-year roadmap. It's roughly my work when I joined the agency. The first thing they said is, Eva, you know, what do you want to do? All of this. So first, coordinate CISA's own open source. How are we using it? What are we doing with it? What are we publishing? Partnering with open source communities and building connections and bridges like this one, and more that I'll talk about at the end of the talk to drive collective action across centralized open source entities. Because places like package managers, uh, distribution platforms, they are in a, a kneeling point for the process of co-creating code. And so they're a natural place to focus investments in security improvements. We did some work with the OpenSSF um, Supply Chain Security Group and published the principles for package repository security. I can't kind of get the name right, change. Um, with just a set of principles, like if you are running PyPI or anything like that, what are some baseline security things you should be doing to help your community be better protected against typo squatting, malware uploads, things like that? Um, and we are trying to increase external engagement, like me and my team coming to events like this to spend time with all of you. We are studying the prevalence of open source across Federal, federal networks, federal civilian networks, I don't touch the DOD stuff, um, and we're developing a framework to assess systemic risk that is unique to open source. Not, uh, yeah, we'll talk more about that at the end, some of our recent stuff, but that's, that's more long tail and in, in progress. And we're trying to assess the risks to critical infrastructure in particular um, that we could help mitigate. We are evaluating offering shared services to other federal agencies. Uh, it may come as a surprise that states and federal government agencies all use open source right now, lots of it, as do the contractors that build and run our systems. So we, we as CISA, one of the things we do is we provide services to other federal agencies around IT and around security. So we're looking at, are there specifically open source focused services we could offer? We're developing policies around open source and piloting uh, I wanted to say the first, turns out, no, we're the second OSPO in the federal government. Um, CMS, Health and Human, Human Services, was the first. Kudos to them. Great folks. Love working with Remy. Um, speaking of policies, I don't have a slide for it, but I did want to just share, in case you missed it, you probably did. Back in July, the White House, the White House releases their annual budget priorities. They, that's how they tell all the federal agencies, hey, here's how we think you should spend money this year. They included a call out for open source program offices saying to all federal agencies, please ask for money to build and fund an OSPO to secure the open source you're using and develop policies for contributing back. I'm really happy about that. <laughs> Lastly, uh, goal four, harden the ecosystem overall. That's things like driving adoption of memory-safe programming languages. Uh, if you work at all with Rust, you may have noticed DARPA launched Tractor. It's a, a tool chain request for automated translation of C into Rust. I've seen DARPA do this twice before with C. I hope it works this time. <laughs> AI will solve all our problems. Yeah. Um, continuing to advance uh, state of the art around software bill of materials. Uh, working towards, working on security education and focusing on improving the coordinated disclosure of vulnerabilities in open source. That's a big one. So, some things you can do. Um, a year ago, August, White House and Office of the National Cyber Director published an RFI, it's a request for input on open source security and what the government can do. Uh, this was kind of a landmark first time that the White House has put this much attention in. We had over 100 responses, uh, about 10 federal agencies, don't quote me the number, roughly, um, participating in the review process, the discussion process for a whole year. And we published the report. I got to get up on stage at DEF CON with uh, the Office of the National Cyber Director and talk about this report and what the federal government has learned. Uh, mostly stuff that did not surprise me as a maintainer for a long time. Some of it was 
from different corners of the ecosystem I didn't know. But this is also a landmark because it becomes a report that persists after this administration as a durable record of you all speaking to the government, saying, here's how to do better. So if any of you did submit to that, thank you. Um, it is also public. You can go read it. And the report uh, is both summary of feedback, but also an outline of the prioritization that the federal government has chosen to make based on all the input that we got. So that's public. That's up there. Um, we published a guide. This is really focused on enterprises who use open source. But if you work at a company that is either, you know, maybe not as good a consumer of open source as you'd like, um, or you're at a small startup, and they're looking for ways to do this, looking for guidance to do this. Um, this document describes in some depth how to be a responsible consumer of open source software. What are some common mitigations that our techniques to avoid? Excuse me. To avoid situations like left pad taking down your prod. We publish the principles for package repositories that differentiates a couple different levels of security um, and what you can do if you're a consumer, again, of open source is select packages from trustworthy sources, where trustworthy is very subjective. Um, cache it in your own environment. Don't update your customers directly from third-party sources on the internet, maybe. Um, we also published back in March this tabletop exercise packet, which Again, I'm super proud of, I worked on this one a lot. Um, I got to play a dungeon master. How many of you played D&D? Thank you. Um, I treated this like a D&D campaign. A four hour mini campaign, I killed all my players, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> um, but it was, it was fun, and it's published as a template that you can use to go try it out in your organization or in your project community in Apache. And in fact, today, 2 to 5.30, we're going to run this exercise again for you all. QR code there to sign up. Um, Brian's our gatekeeper for who gets in the door because the room isn't that big. But please, if you work on security at all or you're a maintainer, uh, sorry, committer, please think about coming joining us this afternoon. Um, and we published a uh, study on memory safety and open source, picking uh, about 100-ish critical projects, uh, and analyzing how many of them use a memory safe language, how many of them don't. And then our researchers, uh, I asked them to sort of drill down, you know, top level maybe memory, memory safe language, but what about the dependencies? What if we go all the way down to the bottom of the dependency stack? Unsurprising to me, they could not find anything that was memory safe all the way down. Um, but budget wasn't infinite, we didn't check everything. Basically, it's important that we also all invest in moving to memory safe languages because back in the 90s, I was writing code to try and fix memory safety issues and buffer overflows in other people's code. It's more than 30 years, folks. We've got to get away from buffer overflows and out of bounds being the most common type of remote exploit. Um, lastly, I said I talked about this a little bit. Uh, trustworthiness, um, we, it's a lot more context if you want to chat about what I mean by this, find me later, but essentially uh, we are funding some work around, uh, it's open source code, uh, a project called HipCheck, developed by MITRE, for client side assessing how well is a project developed and were there anomalies in the development. Um, is it, does the project usually have good code review? and a pretty normal range of cryptographic complexity. And then suddenly one day, one patch lands with no code review, an unknown committer, and a high cryptographic complexity. You should probably review that before promoting it to fraud. That's an example of the thematic approach this is taking, not looking at who's writing the code or where it was written or how it was written, but rather how was the process behind its development. And this is based on the framework that I started, I said I wouldn't talk about DOD much, just a tiny bit, um, a couple years ago, on uh, assessing the project, product, 
policies around it and the protections around it as a means of vetting open source to be consumed into um, more secure environments. I'm hoping they'll publish that soon. Lastly, um, I, this is an interesting thing that I wish I had a lot of time to explain. Essentially, partnering with DHS Silicon Valley Innovation Program, they are putting some around $10 million into open source to advance software artifact dependency graph generation. It's a big term, essentially reapplying a uh, directed acyclic graph or a Merkle tree, not just to source code in place, but across the development pipeline. So that when you have an artifact, uh, a software you're running in production, a container you're running in production, can it contain all the fingerprints in a dependency graph, not an SBOM, of all the code that was used to build it all the way down the stack. Nix already does this. Omnibor does this in a few projects. Uh, Bazel really does this as well. There's probably other techniques out there. I've heard from a number of companies that their internal build and debug systems have done this for a decade. Why doesn't it happen by default in open source? Why don't all of our build tools automatically emit supply chain fingerprints? Not a full SVOM, just enough fingerprint to know that this binary came from that version of OpenSSL.h. It can be done, I think we should. So DHS is putting some money into that. The solicitation is open right now. There's an event in California on October 17th. <coughs> I'll be there. Signups are open. If you're able to make it, great. If not, there's a virtual stream. And if you work at um, a startup of a certain size, there's criteria up there you can find. I'm not going to try to paraphrase them essentially focused at like small to mid-sized startups. And you work on technology like this, I'd encourage you to please apply. It is up to $1.7 million in the federal funding, non-dilutive to startups, uh, to build both a commercial product around this and contribute that capability to an open source ecosystem. So federal funding supporting development of secure open source. And try. We're getting there. Uh, and then lastly, really lastly, with AI, please don't forget all the lessons of secure development of open source. Everyone's really focused on how can we take and customize and go faster with AI and other questions around legal complexities I'm not gonna touch. Um, but supply chain attacks against AI training systems are also on the rise, both against the software stacks used and against the data that data training is relying on. Data poisoning attacks are difficult but impossible to detect, and if one has occurred and you don't have the source code, the source data rather, it's practically impossible to remove that uh, data poisoning result, the backdoor, from the model. So ask yourself, for the four software freedoms, how do you get a model you can truly study and modify? to have the same guarantees around the ability, the self-sovereignty, to fix it, patch it, analyze it, improve it. And for folks who are deploying AI, again, all the same secure supply chain tasks are relevant. Make sure you are um, not updating from the internet, you're vetting, you're testing, because Folks are targeting this a little too much right now. Um, I will be around for questions uh, in the break. I think that's 10, 20-ish, if you want to come up and chat. Um, or again, sign up for the table of exercise at 2 p.m. today. Thank you all so much.